Thursday night ICC Hin Chess Banner Blitz sponsored by ICC also known as the Internet Chess Club. Tonight we've got an excellent presentation for you I think following through on the Bishop pair. We're going to look at three games from the father of Russian chess Mikhail Moisevich Bodvinik and amazingly enough all three games were from his world championship uh, <clears throat> tournament and then matches okay and it says I'm now accepting request so Mr. McKnight's there you go uh, unrated game of 5-0 okay Yeah, I don't know why I'm not getting any noise. Probably I got to turn my volume up. That'll help. Okay. Ah, let's bring the night out. Okay, good. Good play there. Okay, let's see what he's got on this. I uh, see three Sicilian. Great opening. I uh, did some videos on it years and years ago, and of course, it's probably forgotten almost everything. But anyway, great opening. Why study all the mainline Nidorf and Sveshnikov and Classical and Dragons? Whereas you can play C3 on one of these positions and get them to play your game. To me, that makes a lot more sense. Okay, but now he did a bunny hop on me. He went one and then he went again. Hmm, what am I supposed to do? Well, part of me wants to play D6. Part of me wants to play D5. Uh, not so enamored of playing a6. I haven't seen bishop b5 in that exact position, to tell you the truth. Ah, oh, what the heck. Let's play queen up. Wow, I've spent almost a minute on an opening that I should know. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Server announcement. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Well... Let's put the question to the bishop, as they say. Now, at least I don't have trouble pawns. I'm just way behind in development. Eh, pick your poison, right? Knight on b6 is not fabulous, I, I must say. Can we go pin this guy? Pinsky, this guy. At least we got him out. Now, is this crazy? Just pop in there like that? I mean, there's probably nothing wrong with e6. e6 might have been a little more solid, if you will. Oh, yeah, now he's going to get like a massive, massive center when I take his bishop. But I kind of am in that route. I guess I could have played pawn takes pawn, but that, that might have been very, very messy. Yeah, now I need a move to get bishop to e7 in. Now that's a bummer, because when I play bishop e7, he can play queen to g3. Rats. Rats. Okay, I think... Now I could just take that. Boy, and have a massive center. Think, think, think. not thrilled with that because then I'm going to have a problem here. Why, clarity is not here today, is it? Ah, not thrilled with that. I just didn't want to lose more time.
I mean, should I have been playing F6 there? I don't know. What's he going to do now? We need to move, Ron. Yeah, I'm hoping that I can defend laterally if he starts trying to attack me. I didn't want the knight going b3 to c5, so... Plus, this puts a little pressure on this guy, on c3. Okay, now let's go down here. I guess rook b3 would have been another way to go. Well, let's swing over here. Games could be a bit tricky here. Okay, pin that knight. Server announcement. Yeah, we keep him a little busy. Whew. Yeah, this knight's a little bit boxed. Check. Check. Yeah, I should have a healthy majority on this side. King has to always stay in the square of this guy, though. Check. That was a little triangulation, but didn't do what we wanted. Okay, try again. Now, if I go there and he goes there and I go there, then he can shoot with that guy. Am I getting too far in? Check. Check.
Ah, so. he's winning. Good job. Why are you coming for challenge? Ah, good game, sir. I overpressed it a little, and you were winning. Okay, let's see. Let's play Foxy. Uh, we missed him last week because he he showed up late. McKnight, you had me there, buddy. That was that was your your moment. But that king and pawn ending should be good for me. Ah, oh, what to do? Ah, oh, what to do? like I'm playing a King's Indian defense, which I know like almost nothing about. Which, you know, is a great way to get in trouble. And for sure, for sure, Knight C6 is not a variation that I would normally play against the King's Indian defense, uh, the same-ish. Ah, what can you do though? What can you do? Yeah, well played. Okay. Oh, whew. to channel our inner Mikhail Tal. So far, not very impressive play by Mr. Henley tonight. Completely lost in the ending. And I'm bungling up that one. crazy moment to play knight a5, but then knight takes b5. Ah, oh, of course I'm stupid. I have knight takes c4. Duh. So what else? I mean, knight on e7 sucks. Why did I go there? Knight a5 was clearly the way to play. Oh, idiot. I should have played bishop d7, killed the knight, and then gone there. Duh. Ay, 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 ay. Yeah, bishop d7, 
touch the knight, and then put your knight on this beautiful square. Jeez whiz. Well, we could always go back and retry. Oh, he was threatening knight h5. That was that was lucky that I uh, happened to think about going there. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. In that case, rook h8 might have been a better way to fly. I guess f6, knight takes. f6 was possible. What's happening now on f4? I guess bishop g4, knight h. Check. So what is this though? This, this trucks a pawn. This, I'm not a buyer. But how do I take it? Knight takes, takes, bishop takes. He's going to play g4. Well, I said I wasn't happy with the knight, so... <clears throat> that guy. I'm a little bit suspicious of this attack here. Okay, that's not entirely true. I'm actually a lot suspicious. Wow! That's a whole piece over there. Holy cow, you can play like that? I guess. Those babies got to go. Okay, now I think we're in cruise control. And I think we survived the worst. We didn't even play an 82 check and take that rook. Oh well. We will get Boy there. Okay, so. Game okay, not a great started. opening to be sure. There's Medinov. I know he wants me to play e4. Oh, yeah, I got your email there. Uh, but I have so much stuff from school. They, uh, had me empty out the locker at school, and so I just don't know where I would put anything at this point. So the Tory attack. Uh, first Grandmaster from Mexico, Eugene Tory, played it in, what was it, Moscow 1935. And he beat Lasker and another Grandmaster, maybe Samish? And so I don't know why it's gone out of favor. It's certainly a reasonable way to play. Who am I playing? Mr. Nezhmedinov? Now the question is, where does the queen go here? Let's go here for the moment. Pretend like we know what we're doing. Oof, oof. Now, of course, he can always chase down my bishop. He's not chasing my bishop. He's threatening to go there. Okay, we don't really want him playing b5. That's maybe too much to give him. Now, of course, he can play a5, and then you get this kind of maneuvering thing. Mm. 
Now the point of queen c2, of course, get off the d file, but also a little more protection for this guy. Now there, of course, castling, letting him take it, try to hit rip d1 and knight d6, but it doesn't seem to make an impression. Or it does, but not a very strong one. Kasparov actually played the Tory attack and beat uh, Marjanovic, somewhere around 72. Classic game. So I know that this is not the exciting, slashing, dashing tactical play that uh, my friend Nezhmedinov likes, but I've had a long week at school and I'm not sure my nerves could handle that, so I'm playing in a little more restrained manner, pushing his knight back, presumably to d7. Right. Sir, you can't do that. I just attacked a piece. Oh no. And now it's definitely time to castle. Okay, in principle, sometimes white plays in this opening against the light squares. And sometimes the bishop on g7 can be a problem when you get the pawn on e5. McKnights, give me a rematch, buddy. Oh. Okay, this is going a little beyond the pale. is almost dominated. I have a vision of trying to get to that F7 pawn. Resigns. Yeah, sorry about that, buddy. Uh, just not up to... Mr. McKnight, you got one more game in you, buddy? You played great. You were winning in the pawn ending when I overpressed. So let's see, how are we doing on time? I guess we could go ahead and take a look at our presentation for tonight on the bishop pair. If we go to view, let's uh, close the challenges for a moment. And uh, it's not clear if ICC is here, but okay. So if we go to view, we go to my profile, we go to games. Okay, Kane, I'm not up for it. Haven't played in a week due to the virus. Okay, hope you're hope all is well there, buddy. And I uh, hope hope everything's okay with your dad. Uh, so we go to the game library. So as I mentioned earlier tonight's presentation, we're going to continue on the bishop pair. And uh, now, <clears throat> last week we saw Salo Floor, one of the early guys who was a really strong player in the uh, Russian school as it was developing in the 30s and 40s, you know, before the world realized how good they really were. And uh, then part of the fruit of that was Mikhail Botvinik, Smyslov, Tal, all these great players that came out in the 50s. Okay, so. Starting with Botvinikova. This is from the uh, World Championship Server. tournament in 1948. Botvinik's playing white against Dr. Max Erva, who, you know, for like uh, a couple of years, 1935 to 1937, was world champion. 
uh, beat Al Yekin, lost the rematch. Okay. Uh, but probably Irva's greatest contribution was being the first head of FIDE for something like 25 years or something, and he saw him through, you know, some very, very tough periods. So anyway, now Black plays a Slav, and Botvinnik plays E3. That's super solid Moran variation. Botvinnik, of course, was would later introduce and refine the bishop to g5 to the extent that it actually became known as the Botvinnik variation, bishop g5. Kamsky won some brilliant games in the 90s uh, against uh, Kramnik and a few players. Uh, but, let's see, e3. Now, Karpov, of course, has always kind of favored the Moran, and then later he moved over to the queen c2 Slav. Okay, so, knight out, bishop out, and bishop b4. I think that's the beginning of going slightly astray. Uh, current mainline theory is to play something more like dc takes b5 and then a6 and try to play c5 and so forth. Okay, but bishop b4. Because what are you going to do when you put the bishop out there? Well, Bodvinny kicks it and asks him exactly that question. Are you going to really give up that bishop for the knight? And now he backs up. And I tend to be skeptical about openings where you put the bishop on b5, and then when it's kicked, you go to a5. Okay, so queen c2. Queen e7. Bishop d2. Takes, takes. And you can see white has a little more center, a little freer development. Black has to figure out what the story is with this uh, this bishop here. Let's see. This bishop is a little bit of a problem child. Black needs to solve that problem. Eventually. But anyway, first thing, he plays e5, trying to free his game. But many castles. And now, full commitment. You might expect rook to c1, or the f rook to d1. But Bodvinnik's like, okay, if you play pawn takes pawn, and I play pawn takes pawn, bam, I'm on the open file. He goes bishop back to c7. Now he goes knight e4, trading down a little bit of material, and freeing up his bishop, and introducing a little bishop to b4, or bishop to c3 action. He goes knight takes, takes, and a5. A5 stops the bishop to b4. Bishop back to a2, a little quiet waiting move, getting out of the range of this knight. Knight to f6, queen over, and pawn up. Where's this knight going? Yeah, you could play knight up to g5, but Botvinnik shows a very interesting idea, very dynamic. A lot of your super strong grandmasters have no problem at all sacrificing a pawn and he got the two bishops. He got the bishop pair in return. Okay, and look at these bishops. I think uh, they call these the Horowitz bishops. One bishop aimed at the king, another bishop aimed at the king's side, the queen, the knight on f6. He goes back. Now, of course, it would be premature to play bishop takes knight. Well, one, he could take with the queen, and then the pawn on b2 is hanging. But no, he plays f3, looking to open up. Well, Irva, under pressure, says, look, I'd better go ahead and give you back the pawn, but you got double pawns. So this is probably dynamically very, very, very interesting because Kasparov considers the bishop pair to be worth about six and a half, which means white has an extra half pawn. On the other hand, some people feel that double pawns are only worth half. So very interesting uh, dynamic here. However, the other factor here is that white has the open f file and now the open d file. So white is still ahead in development. Even if you consider that the material component is equal, white is ahead in development. And boom. I mean, it would be a different story if he had time to play rook up, rook over, barricade in on e5. But of course, he's got tactical issues on f7. Now the c6 pawn is under attack. He throws in a touch on the rook. The rook goes to f2. Now that's an interesting move, because if black tries to play tactically and play rook to d8, the idea being that if you trade and trade some kind of rook d1 check, well, white has bishop f7 check. So now he plays bishop b5 to guard the pawn. But now this pawn lurches forward. And again, this is the problem with the two bishops, facing the two bishops is 
which square do you fight on? Which color complex? So he goes knight back. And now the pawn comes up, takes away more squares in the center. And so your real problem here with black is your knight does not have an outpost. Well, he tries to cure that, but now he goes e6. And first fruits of his labor, he plucks the b-pawn. That kills black's queenside majority, destabilizes the bishop. Bishop goes back. And now, nice finishing combination by Bodvinik. Rook takes bishop. Discover sure. check from the pawn. Rook interposes. And pin and win. Now, I think Irva actually resigned here. But why? Well, this rook is pinned, and he's threatening simply to take the knight, promote the pawn. And if the rook comes over, he takes it anyway. Now when you eliminate the pawn, well, check. then bishop check. Bishop takes over here on a5. You've got a monster outside past pawn. You're just going to put the bishop back on c3, march that bad boy up the board. White has eliminated all black counterplay. Just a beautiful, clean example by Botvinnik on play with the bishop pair. Bam, right out of the opening. And it all goes back to this very interesting idea where he played knight e5. And in fact, Judith Polgar used that later. The one game that she beat Anand that I'm aware of in tournament play, uh, she didn't have a great record against Anand, but she used a similar concept in the Petrov where she went knight e5, gave up the pawn, got the bishop pair, and a uh, very nice game. Or maybe I'm confusing that with another game. But this idea of giving up this pawn on e5 and getting the bishop pair has been seen. But, of course, Botvinnik was probably one of the first to do it. Okay, now the next game. This is one of the all-time classics. In his first title defense, Botvinnik was playing Bronstein, David Bronstein, by many considered, you know, maybe one of the best players never to win the world championship. But he came oh so close. After 23 games, he was one game ahead. In those days, like when Fisher played Spassky, he was best of 24, except uh, in those days, on a tie match, the world champion retained his title. And now knight h3. Very interesting idea. Sometimes when you're playing black in a symmetrical Gruenfeld, like famous game Fisher was black against Donald Byrne, in order to avoid the symmetry, Bobby with black played like pawn up, and knight up. And that allowed, you know, a little bit difference in play. So Botvinnik takes it to another level by playing knight over. He may go knight to f4, put a lot of pressure on this pawn, and then try to lever things open with e4. But Bronstein was a deep original thinker and shows he's not afraid to give up the bishop here. So he gives up the bishop. That solves his c8 bishop problem. Karpov told me that a lot of times when you play black in a lot of openings, take the Cairo Khan, but especially the French defense, that the c8 bishop, the light squared bishop, is quite often the biggest problem child. Look at the Stonewall Dutch. In the Stonewall Dutch, what do you do? You either play b6 and bishop out. Sometimes you go bishop d7 to e8 out to, to the king side. So in one shot, Bronstein gives up the bishop and he gains time. And so basically you can see in this position, black is the equivalent of a move ahead, but he has given white the long-term uh, potential advantage of the bishop pair. Now keep in mind, Botvinnik had to win this game, okay? And so what's amazing is the tremendous patience that he shows in a situation where he has to win. He doesn't rush to play f3 and e4 in some crazy kingside attack. He just very patiently, look at this, knight up, positions his, and then he offers a queen trade. I mean, in a position, in a game that he has to win to retain his title. Okay, so what happens? Knight comes in. And now this is very nice. He trades, gives him the double pawns, and then says, look, I'm holding on to my bishop here. How could I possibly win this game if I give up my bishop here? He goes knight over. He goes knight back. He goes bishop back. So now you get a little bit of maneuvering. And now that f3 move. That's something we discussed from Steinitz. Using your pawns to deprive the enemy knights of outpost, especially in the center, okay? Very typical two bishop technique. Okay, so bishop f2. I mean, look at what contortions he went to keep this bishop and then just to put it on f2. 
But again, it's only temporary. Bishop comes out to touch the e3 pawn. He comes over, offers to trade a pair of rooks. He goes knight in. Now he's touching the e3 pawn. Just rook over to defend. Okay, so he's shuffling back and forth. It's hard for black to make progress, but now Bodvinik says, okay, I need more protection on the e3 pawn. How much is the king worth in the end game? I uh, take the view that uh, I agree with the Aster Sire one, about three and a half points. So he brings the king over. Bishop back, and now starts to gain space on the king side. g4. Knight back, shuffling around, pawn to b3. And again, keep in mind, Bronstein only needs to make a draw in this game to become world champion. He's one game up. Now the king comes over. Now the bishop goes back. Pawn up. Knight back. And now he's created a weakness on the b4 square. Knight comes over. Bishop goes back. Pawn up. Rook over. Very, very patient play. Now here's a very interesting moment. He trades a pair of rooks and then offers to trade another pair. Bronstein takes, takes, and then seizes the opportunity to win a pawn. He plays bishop to a3. Well, if you move the knight, he's just going to take the pawn on b3 for free. So he defends the knight, but now bishop takes knight. Now, this is fascinating. About 75 years later, Hikaru Nakamura playing, playing black against Magnus Carlsen, where Magnus had a rook and two bishops against rook, bishop, and knight, uh, did something sim similar, where he gave up this second bishop for this knight. In that game, it was 22, bishop takes c3. Got a little bit of temporary counterplay, but Magnus neutralized it, traded the rooks, and then with his two bishops, won a beautiful game. That was London 2015. Highly recommend looking up that game. London 2015, Carlson versus Nakamura. Beautiful, exquisite two-bishop game. Okay, so he takes check. check, even takes the pawn with check. King comes up. But notice that he's, his extra pawn is doubled. And he can't really, by force, create a passed pawn. Okay, so the knight goes back. Now we get a bit of maneuvering around, okay? A little gain of space there. Takes, takes, and now bishop to d3. Now if you trade off all these pawns, this bishop gets centralized, keeps an eye on b7 and an eye on h7. So Bodvinik protects. He goes in with the bishop. Now notice how the bishops are semi-dominating the knights. Uh, this knight can't really move so easy, but the other knight can. He goes back. Now, as Botvinnik described, part of this is you play on their nerves. Even though you don't see a clear win, now at this point, there is a threat, possibly to play e5 check and try to steal the pawn, although the king could go to g7. He, he secures the pawn. But every time black moves that h pawn forward, it gets closer to the white side of the board, obviously. And now he touches it again. Now he goes again. Now Botvinnik plays brilliantly. He takes, takes, and then h4. H4 freezes the pawn. It also gives the bishop access to g5. Now, for example, if black were to play knight e7, you could contemplate bishop check, king back, take the knight, and bishop to g6. So at this point, the white light-squared bishop is a potential monster. It's got potential targets on b7, d5, and h5. And so this is why the two bishops are so powerful as a team, Check. because they're very synergistic. And see now, he's got the possibility to sneak in here to c8 and just relieve him of this pawn. And not only that, when he takes that pawn, he removes some of the uh, support for the knights. So now he goes bishop back, touching the knight. He goes back. He comes back, reposition, stops him from playing b5. Don't want to let him liquidate his pawn. Touches the weakness. King is the only piece that can come up to guard that. Check. Now he checks him. Plays on his nerve a little. Okay. And then goes back. Petrosian, Bodvinik, some of these technical players, that was one of their favorite techniques. Sire one used to do that. Is once you've got a position where you're in control, you repeat moves. Not three times, but maybe once or twice, just to show them that you're in charge. 
and buy more time to think, and in general play on their nerves. So he goes back. But now he touches the knight. Now let's take a look at this situation. Black is in Zugzwang. Zugzwang comes from the German compulsion to move. It's a uh, motif apparently comes up in many two-player games. The knight on c8 is charged with guarding the knight on e7. The knight on e7 has to guard the pawn on d5. The king can't move because he's guarding the pawn on h5. Basically, black has nothing to move. In the game, he jettisoned this pawn, but after pawn takes and b6, he simply moved his king, a pass move, and black resigned. So the match was a tie, but Botvinnik remained world champion. Very, very critical game in his career, and you can see what to do. Once he loses one of these pawns, his problems are not going to be solved, and white is also going to have a passed pawn. He's just going to overpower the uh, poor knights. So just an absolute classic game in study of play with the bishop pair. Now, the last game we're going to take a look at is uh, from his nemesis, Mikhail Tal. And let's see, what was this? This was a 1961 match. Uh, I believe this is the match where Tal figured out that he needed to play strategic chess and not let, uh, I mean, uh, Botvinnik realized he had to play strategic chess. Aha! So we got the sameish King's Indian, uh, much like uh, Foxy Openings played against me. Okay, c6. Now the c6 and a6 and b5, that later would become known as the burn variation. Bishop d3, but now this is more like a classical variation. Okay, knight e2 takes. Bishop takes is a little unusual. Normally you would expect to take with the knight, but okay. But now he transposes, plays c5. And interesting, he puts the bishop back on f2. I guess he's thinking maybe at some moment the bishop on e3 is not unprotected. Bishop to f2 is a bit of a strange choice. And castles a6. But you can see black has a, kind of a static weakness on d5 and a backward pawn on an open file on d6. Now one of the big moments Zurich 1953 was the realization that a backward pawn on the d-file was not the end of the world. But in this situation, Tal never really manages to generate counterplay to compensate for that pawn. Whereas Botvinnik, you know, just methodically builds up his position. Okay, now you'd think he's going to try to play some kind of b5. Botvinnik just plays pawn to b3, you can see. So one bishop is not so good, the light squared bishop. But the dark squared bishop, on the other hand, is very, very good. He goes rook over. It's clear he's thinking about trying to play some b5, get some active counterplay. He goes bishop back, protecting the base, and unleashing the queen on the d-pawn. Now, in this scenario, if he can take the d-pawn, he may well do it, because then he'll be attacking the c-pawn as well. You might expect to move like rook d8, but then bishop h4 might be a little bit annoying with the pin. He does that, but instead of bishop h4, he goes for f4. Bishop to g4. Kicks the knight. He takes, and now interestingly enough, he takes and offers a queen trade. And one of the things Botvinnik discovered is that in principle he should almost always trade queens with Tal, and uh, kind of like defanging the serpent. It reduces the uh, brilliancy possibilities. Okay, rook e8. So he's hoping to get counterplay against the e4 pawn to offset his weakness on d6, but simply knight to g3, and when you have more space, it's easier to maneuver your pieces and defend. So rook over. So you can see the bishop on f8. Yes, it is guarding the pawn, but for a king's and in defense player, your dream is to have that bishop raking their king side or coming into d4 and raking their king when they're castle king side, not to go back to f8 to defend your backward pawn on a half-open file. Anyway, Botvinnik repositions his knight, secures his pawn. You can see the pawn is attacked 1, 2, 3, and it's defended 1, 2, 3. And why did he reposition the knight? Because he wants to expand on the king side. Okay, now he brings his king up like we saw before. 
he reroutes the knight. Now he touches the rook. So black has to make an un unpleasant choice. Either he puts a pawn on f6, killing his bishop again, or he moves the rook. He offers to counterattack the pawn on f4. But Bodvinik just simply steps aside. He goes rook over. He goes pawn to g5. Pawn up two squares. And now, interesting move, he plays pawn takes pawn. You might think that he would just back up. But he's discovered that there's a weakness on f6. And the knight suddenly leaps into the game with a vengeance, attacking the bishop. Now, if he goes knight takes pawn check, forking the rook and the king, he'll simply play rook takes, bishop takes, and then knight check and pick off a whole rook, and that should net a piece for a pawn. So, he has to back it up, but still, check. you've accomplished something here because you forced him to give up his second bishop. Now, unlike in the previous game, black does actually have an outpost on d4, but white's able to pretty much work around that, so we don't necessarily even see Tal ever actually try to utilize that. He goes back. He goes rook over, he goes knight up, attacking the bishop, but he pulls this guy back, and you can see this is just a beautiful bishop. This one is doing its job supporting the e4 pawn, but the dark squared bishop is the, the beauty. But now, he uses it to chase this knight. He leaves it sit there. Now he touches the rook again kicks the rook off the uh, d file, and then pawn to f5. Very nice play. If he tries to go knight back to f6, he could probably win some pawns with pawn takes pawn and rook takes pawn check or something. So he goes back. But now look at this. Pawn to f6, domination. The poor knight on h5, this guy is just trapped. Can't get out at all. So he goes b5, looking for counterplay. But now, rook to d5. Now he's got two hits on it, and the poor knight can't, can't escape. Well, pawn takes, pawn takes, and then rook over. Now again, delayed gratification. He doesn't rush to take that. Instead, he improves his king position. He goes rook up, offering an exchange sacrifice. But converting advantages, that's one of the keys to good technique. What Bodvinik does here is absolutely excellent in terms of instructive value. He plays bishop takes, knight takes. Now, rather than try to win material, he plays bishop takes, gives back the exchange, pawn takes, pawn takes, and he still has not won any material, but he's converted to a rook game. How do we assess this rook game? Well, let's look at it on a relative value basis. First off, the white king is up on f3, the black king is on the back rank. The white king is a little better. Secondly, the white king has a possibility king f4 to g5 and taking the pawn on h5. Next, the pawns. The pawn on f6 is clearly superior to the pawn on f7, and the pawn on d5 is also superior to the pawn on d6. Why? Because you'll see later, if we get into a pawn grabbing contest, the white pawns are going to be closer to promotion. And after rook to b1, the white rook is definitely superior to the black rook. Well, there's three open files on the board. The white rook has one, and the black rook is passively stuck defending pawns. So on a case-by-case, piece-by-piece comparison, you can see that even though white's not any material up yet, he definitely has qualitative superiority. And now... He's attacking the a6 pawn and the d6 pawn. King runs over, but again, delayed gratification. Notice he doesn't rush to grab the a6 pawn, but instead he improves his king position because he sees the black king is coming. When he goes up, he gets his own king Check. in position, and he knocks this guy out. Yeah, the d6 pawn is not going anywhere. Well, Tal activates his rook. He goes h4. He goes rook over. Now he takes on d6. Check. He goes rook check. Now I thought there that he was going to check and take that pawn. 
He goes king over, taps that guy. Check. Brings his king over towards his two center pawns. He goes rook over, but that pawn is bait. He takes this guy out. And I could have also played rook c6 to take the c5 pawn. But what Tall does here is he simply liquidates down to a winning game. Now he goes after the c-pawn. After rook down, he's got two connected pass pawns. The game is pretty much over. He takes that. He goes rook down. He gives up that one. But again, qualitative superiority plus he's got an extra pawn. Now the c-pawn is just threatening to rumble up the board. When he goes check. Check. And now, very nice, offers to trade rooks. When he goes back, he just goes king up, and at this point, Tal resigned. What's going on here? Well, this king and these two pawns are simply going to run over that rook like a steamroller. And meanwhile, your rook, you've executed what we call a file cut. You've cut the black king off on the e-file. Black, in order to get counterplay, is going to move his king, move his pawn, and it's going to take him a long time. But meanwhile, white's just going to play d6, c5 king up and he's going to queen a full pawn. You may give up a rook for one pawn, but you're not going to stop both of them. Very nice. Offer to trade rooks. If we go back here, he offered to trade rooks and then he'd also executed the file cut, totally cutting the black king out of the game. So, very nice. Critical games in Botvinnik's career. Three times in the world championship he won with the bishop pair. So yes, I think one of the things that I have to say I really admire when I study the games of these great masters, like we studied Floor last week and Botvinnik this week, is how patient they were in winning positions. Okay, Nezhmednov. Rated game of 5-0. Game started. Oh, okay. Now he got white. Was he playing something crazy like b3 and bishop b2 and queen e2 and something like that before? Okay, so McKnight's, uh, my condolences there. Okay, no matter what I play, probably going to play some crazy gambit. Oh, I could have played, I could have played g6. Oh well, could have, should have, did it, did it, did it. What can you do? I've never enjoyed playing the black side of this, truth be told. I had a very bad experience Check. once against uh, Grandmaster Betchesera in the Florida State Championship. Check. Bishop g5 is an interesting move.
server announcement. Oh no. <clears throat> uh, sorry about that, dude. Boy coming resound. Sorry. Yeah, I need Bishop back to E3. You know, it's a game. Box the openings again. Game started. Oh, and I get white. What does he play against D4? It's been so long I've forgotten. Oh. Okay. I pretend like I'm stupid. I have no idea what the Owens defense is. And that's not really hard for me to pretend like. I actually looked at it once years ago and played it for like a month or two. I don't know. I, I know we got to keep those guys off of B4. I do know that much. Hello. I guess you could play knight c3 and bishop b4 and you get kind of a Frenchy type pawn structure. Maybe he takes on c3. Eh. Maybe, maybe I studied too much Karpov when I was a kid and tried to avoid pawn weaknesses. Well, that's a strength and a weakness. Yasser was like that. Really tried to avoid pawn weaknesses whenever possible. Worked out well for him. Yeah, I think uh, quite often as chess players, we become a little bit... Uh, I don't see the mileage in pawn takes pawn. Let's leave him with the uh, fabulous b7 bishop. But as I was going to say, as chess players, I think sometimes we become a little bit uh, impressed, you know, by the dominant people of our era, if you will. And uh, and so, of course, our era, Fisher and Karpov were the dominant players during our formative years as chess players. <clears throat> and by formative years, I mean like, you know, in my case, 15 to 75. Now here, it looks like he's got some vision of coming over here. So let's see if we can go up here. Got to make plans to guard our base pawn. Eh, easier done than said, Fred. Okay, that certainly encourages me to pop in here. D2 seems like a strange square for that guy, because it is. But I have an idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now that's the big question. He wants to trade those guys. I don't want to trade light squared bishops. Server announcement. But my knight is blocking my thing here. And if I play b4.
Okay, so no denying weight has a space advantage, but how useful is it? In the words of the famous philosopher Dr. Spock, fascinating, simply fascinating. Yeah, that's one of those things they do. Now he could try kamikaze on d4, but yeah, I didn't believe it. On the other hand, I just realized this has a a bit of a flaw as well. He took away the retreat square from this puppy. So probably he had to go knight a5. Which, and then I go bishop, and you know, then he goes rook, the game goes on. Yeah, knight a5 was definitely uh, necessary there. Okay, so I don't know how this is going to help with h5, but... The oncoming challenge. Yeah. Okay, rated game of 5-0. Game started. Okay. Is that illegal? And that, that seems like it should be illegal for you to play the Ayakin defense. This is a system that uh, Roman and Lev talked about a little bit in their book. Uh, yeah, what was the name of that book? Uh, Chess Openings for White Explained? I think that was it. The idea with this move now is if they go d5, you can go c5 and you don't have to worry about the annoying knight to c4. So basically their thought is that uh, White should secure the queen side. Thus, all the moves like bishop e3, rook c1, b3, now you kind of escape the influence of this bishop. Nah, for better or for worse. Yeah, white has this little bit of space advantage, and it's kind of up to black to generate the old counter Spieglin. Okay, now that's an interesting take on it. My first thought is just to play knight f3. Server announcement. Why not? I don't really want to play a4. That would give his other knight the b4 square. That's not what we're looking to do. I had a game once when I was a kid with uh, Master from Houston, from Dallas, John Jacobs, really nice guy. Is C5 worth a shot? Try to get our stuff in motion? Or just keep playing positionally? Eh, let's just play this D5. 
Now again, see the rook is guarding. Now that should pretty well compel him to trade bishops. Now notice it's not easy for him to move these two center pawns. So white has a little bit of a grip on the position, but of course improving from here is always another another story. But definitely white's got a little positional pull here. More space. Notice he can't move the F pawn, he weakens the E6 square. He can't move the E pawn because we might just try to take it. And where is that guy going? Is he going to play B5? Well, i got to finish my development, of course, so I castle. H4, H5 doesn't make sense. With my king still in the center, he would just play H5. And he's got a knight that can come there very quickly. Our, our advantage lies in the center and on the queen side. So there's no reason for us to... Yes, just secure the king. That's the ticket. And I'm thinking rook at Ft1, queen to D2, maybe trade off the dark squared bishop, maybe go make a pit stop on G5 first. Interesting whether or not we want to actually trade, though. Uh, I mean, one, trading. Anyway, let's pretend like we want to trade. Oh, uh, darn it, I meant to play rook over first. Duh. Meant to play rook to e1 first. Well, we definitely got to take that. No question. Can't let him escape with the big center there. Okay. Well now, in the words of the famous Jeremy Silliman, we've got to reassess our chess. Oh, I, I don't want to trade knights on e6. Okay, why don't we go this way? Originally I had been planning to go to the e-file, but things change. While the e-file is open, there's a pawn on d6 that needs to be addressed. Now, on the one hand, don't really want to trade because a little trap there. Takes, takes, rookie eight. Can't take the pawn on d6 because the old rookie one tricker. Trickery, 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 truck. Let's go here. Send that queen back home, I think. I think that should send the queen back home. I guess she could go to e5. But it looks a little dicey. Anyway, certainly easier, I think, for white to play than for black. Now, there again, if I trade, he takes with a pawn. I guess knight f4 probably is not bad. Yeah, that, that was probably actually pretty good. Trade, and then knight f4. Okay, now some annoyance there with the bishop move. One feels I'm not necessarily doing this the best. Good move he played. He stopped us from going where we wanted to go. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Take with a queen. Now he's actually managed to organize himself a bit. Although at the end of the day, I find it hard to believe he's going to be able to defend everything. Yeah, I think there f5 was Black probably on time. necessary. Anyway, good game, sir. I think we got time for maybe one or two more. Uh, McKnight, you sure you're not feeling up to a game, dude? Yeah, it's just difficult to play for black because you got weaknesses, white has no risk, white has everything centralized. I mean, yeah, of course, knight c6 was unfortunate time pressure, 
but probably you need to play f5, but then again f5 is more weaknesses. Yeah, actually f5, though knight b6 is probably unpleasant. Then there's possibilities of queen d5 check, and a5 is hanging. Not that that's really the apple of my eye, but actually queen d5 check. Probably something besides that. I was also just thinking simple move, knight to c3. Now knight c6, I can trade and take twice on e4. I can go queen d5 check. And after knight takes, knight takes, rook takes, then suddenly I'm here. This pawn on d6 is just perpetually weak. Yeah, you could play queen f6. But even then, if I just play queen d5 check and triple, it's just technically very unpleasant for black. Okay, and so I got a whole zero rating point for that superb effort. Good thing we don't do this for rating points. So anyway, again, I'd like to thank ICC for sponsoring. That's uh, very kind of them. They're very busy these days, running a lot of online tournaments, also employing a lot of their anti-cheating methods. Uh, that committee is, I think, headed by international master Kenny Regan. Kenny Regan and I and Sarwan and Rode and Jonathan Tisdell, DeFermian, Mark Deason, we all played in the... Uh, what was it, the 76 U.S. Junior in Memphis, Tennessee or something. Amazing, amazing field. I think that field produced something like six or seven Grandmasters and two IMs. So now, of course, the tournaments are very, very strong. But back at that time, that was the strongest one in quite a long time. Uh, let's throw a five-minute challenge out there and see who shows up. Give it a second, and otherwise we may just wrap it up. Famous Dave Chappelle skit. You pull out a clock, the girlfriend's babbling on and on and on. You hit the clock, wrap it up, bang! <laughs> You're talking to salesmen, they keep going on and on. You pull out the clock, the buzzer, bing! Wrap it up! Oh, now in the news today. So, at the AIM Chess, uh, Aronian Carlson, they, they're now to the semifinals. Carlson, in revenge mode, crushed Duda, who had eliminated him like within the last year in one event. And uh, challenge. Game started. Okay, now we got black. What are we going to do against this guy? Okay, G6. playing this like he's got it prepared. Oh, that's right. We did a video on it. Duh. I forgot. By the way, Foxy Openings has produced videos with myself, Roman, Susan Polgar, uh, Andrew Martin, uh, many, of the, many of the best chess players. And uh, now i got to think. Ron, why don't you think before you give away your pawns? My inclination here is to play. Well, let's get developed. When in doubt, let's get developed. Now, in theory, I'm not supposed to take that because it develops the knight. But I mean, maybe I should play c5 first. So the computers like white, they say black's got, white's got too much development, but it's getting dangerous. Not getting dangerous, it already is. Anyway, let's get out of here. Let's castle.
One thing I do know in this opening, you absolutely have to pressure their center. You can't just sit back and let them run you over like a Mack truck. That's clear. Now oh, he's all over my, my pawn on F7. E6 seems kind of obligatory forced. Cannot say that I am in love with it, but it it's what we have to work with. So Wow. Let me just say this about that. coming after me. This is like no holds barred MMA chess. Hope that holds water or whatever it's supposed to hold. I have to say I've not seen this exact scenario before. Learn something new every day, right? Hopefully. But I do know in principle you cannot sit back and just let them blow you over in the center. You gotta fight back. What's the saying? Fight fire with fire. On knight h6 check, I'm thinking I can take it. On knight takes queen, I'm thinking I play knight takes queen check. Rook takes, and then rook takes his queen. I'll be a pawn up. I'm still behind in development, but I think we've avoided getting checkmate. Ted. Okay, now there, I thought I could do this. Check. check. Got to get my piece back. No question there. Now he definitely has a lot of development. No arguing that case. Well, <clears throat> if I had a better position, it would be tempting to sack the exchange here. I think we need to trade before he doubles rooks.
Oh, rook takes. Check. If king takes, boy, I'd like to play king e8, but then bishop e5, check. check, bishop check. So back to the pin, back to the pin, baby. What can you do? I wanted to go king e8, but then bishop check, bishop here, take, take, rook check. Okay, so now that's a bummer. If I take that, a lot of open lines. Wow. I really want that pawn. But I also want to get developed. But if I develop, then he plays d5. d5 is very unpleasant for my team. I could play b5 first. See which way he floats. Why don't I do this? Check. Check. And then get up here. Now at least, if I'd have gone bishop d7, he had rook over to d1. Oh. Well now I want to do this. b5, giving up a pawn was interesting. Oh, now i got to watch out. Okay, push that little puppy. Oh, but now i got to be very careful. Oh. Well now, now we can go technical on him. Oh. Definitely we survived the worst here. Spot this guy up. Guard the seventh rank. But how are we going to progress? <clears throat> Check. Server announcement. Well, lucky he can't play there. Okay. See if we can trade to. Oh, 22 seconds left. We gotta go mock speed. Check. Check. Time warning. He's just playing to win on time. White forfeits Woo. on time. <laughs> oh, buddy. Well, I think that's a that's a great one to end on. I was lucky a minute. I was just trying to take your pieces so I could make a draw at least. Ah, oh, good game. You had some pressure. Gonna have to revisit that opening knight g5. Just brute force. Boom. And uh, no question, you had pretty good comp for the pawn. Anyway. Thank everyone for showing up tonight and participating and special thanks to ICC for uh, sponsoring us and see pretty much everyone here next week I hope and maybe a few more. Okay have a great week uh, Labor Day weekend here in America so enjoy be safe.